Let's look at an example of double integrals and volume. What we have here is a way of expressing the volume for uh, a solid over some region R that doesn't necessarily have to be a rectangle. It's the volume bounded by the function f of two variables x and y over the region R. Let me say it like this. What we're doing is we're finding the volume of some solid like this. It looks to me like a loaf of bread. So we're finding the volume of this loaf of bread where the function f of xy is some surface defined on some region in the xy plane. So here's a z scale. And we have a, an x-axis and a y-axis in some region r. And over that region r, we have this function z that depends on x and y. And we're finding the volume bounded by that surface and the xy plane. That's when, this, when the surface is actually positive. In fact, you can generalize this, that it doesn't really have to be actually volume. It could represent other things. Or you could say, if it did come up with negative values for the, for the function f, um, we could interpret this as sort of a net volume, where you have positive volume above, and you subtract that volume below the xy plane, and you come up with a net volume. You could, you could interpret it that way, just like you did in Calc 1. So instead of integrating over an interval now, we're integrating over a region. And that's why we can sort of generalize the notation like I have here. But you, you can't just plug in R. You have to figure out boundaries for the region that you can then plug in those boundaries into some function uh, that depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the domain values. So let's get to this example. Find the volume of the solid region bounded by the plane x plus 2y plus z equal 2 and the three coordinate planes. So what am I talking about there? Let's draw a picture. Let's start off with an x, y, z axis. And we've got this surface in three-dimensional space given by this equation that happens to be a plane because all of the terms are degree 1. What we could do here is the same thing as you do in beginning algebra where you just get some points. So we can get a picture of this thing. And because it happens to be a plane, I can just graph three points and kind of get an idea of what that looks like. And it's convenient. I chose one that we can graph in the first octant. So um, it's, it's easier to draw the picture. So if I made, now what I need to do is make two of the variables 0 in order to find a third one. So we can go 0, 0, 2. We could go 0 on the x and 0 on the z, and that makes the y value 1. And then we could make the y and z both 0. And if both y and z are 0, then the x is 2. So that gives me three points that I can now graph. So I've got this 2, 0, 0. I've got this point at 0, 1, 0. And then I've got 0, 0, 2. So those three points are on the surface. And because it happens to be a plane, I can draw that surface. At least I can draw a portion of it. So that's, the, that's a portion of the, of the plane as it intersects through the first octant. That's the plane right there. Now, if we move on uh, to actually computing the volume using a, a double integral, which I'm going to save it to the end, but I can do the answer. I can com come up with the answer much easier really quick. <laughs> so why am I going to do all this work? Because I want to illustrate the concepts of the double integral. And we can then apply that when the regions are more complicated. And, this, and the solid that we're trying to calculate is more complicated. And you couldn't just, just do basic geometry. But because this is actually a pyramid with a triangular base, we could calculate the volume for this uh, directly. Um, knowing um, knowing geometry, right? But but let, let's say that to the end. So that you have to suffer through the whole uh, long video before you see the shortcut. Okay. So the thing to do would be to figure out what is this region R, um, and then set up boundaries. So if this is the sort of basic setup, then um, we need to figure out what. Um, the function f is because you you couldn't just put this in for f. This is not f. This is a, this is an expression involving three variables. So we need to solve for z, so that we have uh, and and you can actually do that in this case. You wouldn't 
um, necessarily have z, you know, just as soon as you have a z squared and you have to take a square root, you, so you have to isolate z so that you could write the surface as a function. Only then, if you could write the surface as a function, could you actually use this formula. So this is what I'll make uh, the function f. And then we need to think, think about the region. And so what, what you might do to, to, to be able to visualize and understand what the region r comes from, let's turn this uh, so that we're looking straight down on the region. Here's the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis we don't really need right now, but I'll just draw it out this way. And what I need is the trace of the surface in the xy plane. The trace would be when z equals zero. These are twos. And this trace is a line, right? The, the plane that we're given intersects the xy plane in a line. And I now have the equation of that line because I know that the points on that line are when z is zero as you're intersecting the xy plane. So this equation, x plus 2y equal to 2, is the trace that uh, I'm going to try to graph here. Getting points on this line, I can make x equal 0 and the y is 1, and make y equal 0 and the x is 2. Actually, these are the same points that I just found. It's also including z is 0. So let's see. We have, um, we have 2, 0 and 0, 1. There's the region R where we can see uh, very precisely in a way that's easy to interpret what the boundaries of that region are. The boundaries are the y-axis, and the x-axis, and this line given by this trace. Uh, it's the other boundary of the region. It's when the z is 0 uh, that we can f identify that other boundary. Okay, it's at this point in the process where we have to decide how to set up our boundaries and we have to make a decision. Do we call this a type 1 or type 2 region according to the Stewart book? Um, so what I mean by that is regions like this are referred to type 1 in the Stewart book and uh, they were called vertically simple in the book I used to use before by Larson. Uh, so I might use the term vertically simple. I think I'll just gonna mostly try to stick with type one because that's the Stuart book that we're now using. Um, and also the vertically simple, that the idea of it being simple was somehow kind of misleading, I think so. I think type one just uh, takes out the idea that this might be simple. <laughs> uh, it can get kind of confusing, especially with polar. So. So when it's type 1, what I'm looking for are uh, constant values um, that are these, these vertical uh, lines at x equal a and x equal b. These, these um, left and right endpoints are vertical lines. And the boundaries are defined by curves g1 and g2, the boundaries of the region on which I'm integrating. So these are examples that are type 1 because you have these uh, constant left and right endpoints and you have changing boundaries given by functions that are functions of x. Now just to compare, the type 2 would be things like this where you have a constant um, horizontal um, boundary at a lower and upper point. So in Stewart, these were called the, the horizontally simple regions. Um, and there's two examples here. So we might uh, find a region that we've got upper and lower boundaries that are constant, fixed, and horizontal lines. But our left and right boundaries are curvy and given by some formulas that depend on, on the y value, on the, on the height, on the y scale. So, so h1 and an h2 um, are varying, changing boundaries uh, that define the region. So um, that would be the type 2 region. It turns out in the example that we're looking at, we really could do it either way. But I think most of us are going to pick um, the type 1 uh, and look at this as um, from x equals 0 to x equal 2 and then a changing y value. That's fine and that's the way I'm going to do it. But, but you, you could also have the top boundary be just 
the single point at right here at, at 0, 1 and the bo bottom boundary be this um, x-axis and then you could have the curve defining your, your um, right boundary of the region. So this is both type 1 and type 2 because they're all lines. Um, all the boundaries are, are lines and so you could actually do it either way, type 1 or type 2 and there's many examples of that as you progress through these that you, you'll discover that you could really choose either type 1 or type 2 um, often. Let's go with uh, s taking this as a type 1 region uh, and proceed with the with the region in this sort of a uh, orientation and, and let's see where that goes. One of the things that I might do to you on a test is to actually ask you to write a um, expression for the region um, in this form. So all the points x, y that satisfy some condition and the condition here uh, is that the um, we could specify it as a type 1 to say all the values where the x is between 0 and 2 so the x is between 0 and 2 but the y value uh, changes depending on the x value and it changes exactly according to this this equation so actually in fact what we what we kinda need to do here is to solve for y in order to um, in order to complete this so let's let's say 2y is 2 minus x so the y is always 2 minus x divided by 2 so the y value stays between 0 and a value that would change and it changes depending on where you are between 0 and 2 on the x-axis according to this boundary given by this equation which was the intersection of the surface we were given with the xy plane produces this this boundary line and that is the upper bound of the y values in the region so just being able to set up an expression for the region in terms of inequalities writing in this form is itself a, uh, an exercise that could be a, a specific question on a, on a test alright so so once you've decided on the region this differential in the area represents a sort of general uh, differential amount of area that we can't integrate when it says DA if there's no A in here um, we're expressing um, the height of the um, surface as a function of X and Y and then multiplying that height by some little uh, area uh, in the plane that gives volume so this really means adding up all the heights times the areas of the bases of these uh, incremental uh, amounts of area that total sums to a volume so you were thinking of it kinda like this where f of xy is some height z uh, based on some point in the xy plane DA is some differential amount of area, some little tiny rectangle, or it doesn't even have to be a rectangle. Uh, it's a small increment of area, and it's the product of the height and the area that make volume, and it's the double integral that says that you're summing up all of those areas, um, uh, summing up all those volumes uh, for infinitely many points all through and over the entire region R continuously which is why we use these fancy S's continuously summing volumes of solids that have um, this incremental amount of area times some value for the height at each point uh, for the whole region okay so that that's kind of a uh, conceptually what it, what it represents let's, let's get back to completing the question so if we're gonna do this with a type 1 so we'll take the volume as um, from x equals 0 to x equals 2 and then boundaries for the on the y um, scale are from y equals 0 up to y equals the uh, upper value of y on for each x in other words this this boundary so that is 2 minus x over 2 so the y value depends on the x. And the function, well I have to go back to the previous page to see what the function was. 
There's the function. And then I need to pay attention to the inner bounds, our y values. So first the, uh, diff the integration is with respect to y, and then it's with respect to x, because those are the outer boundaries here. So if I integrate with respect to y, get 2y minus xy minus y squared. Think again, like if you took a partial derivative with respect to y, this is what you would get. So this is sort of a partial antiderivative with respect to y. So once you find the antiderivative, then you've got bounds that we would plug in. So here it really helps to specify what those bounds, what variable they represent so that we don't get confused. Once I complete this uh, inner in integral, then I do the outer one. So this is also referred to as an iterated integration. So plugging this in for the y values, that's plugging in the upper bound minus when you plug in the lower bound. It just so happened that every term has a y and we're plugging in zero. So fortunately all that's just zero. Here I'm going to start simplifying. Distribute. Again, distributing and simplifying, and then collecting like terms. I've got two fourths, take away one fourth is one fourth. And now we just got a regular Calc 1 integral. Okay, we here we have a lower bound of zero and an upper bound of two. So I'm gonna plug in two. And then when I plug in 0, every term has an x, so those all go to 0. So this is 4 over 2. This is 8 over 12. Those cancel. 8 over 12 reduces. There's a 4 that you could cancel. So I get the volume is 2 thirds. Now let's go back. Um, this is the point where I can actually get this volume in a very simple way according to just some basic geometry. Let's check that this is actually correct. So if we go back and look at the surface, I'm trying to find the volume for a pyramid uh, like this. Now here what I'll do is I'll emphasize down here is the base of a pyramid. And being a triangular base, the area is one half times the base, which you could say here is a one and here is a two, and so it's one half the base times the height of that triangle base. So that actually has an area down there, that shaded area is one, and then um, what I need to do is say the volume is being a pyramid, one third the base times the height of the pyramid where B is the area of the base. The height is 2. It was essential that um, I, I actually have um, this point on the z-axis that um, actually corresponds to the height of the pyramid because the z-axis is perpendicular to the xy plane in which the area of the triangle uh, resides. So, so that's it. Its volume is 2 thirds. Uh, it's a nice way in this case that we could check all that work that we had done uh, to, to, to analyze how a double integral would work to find a volume in a more general si situation. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop there with that. I hope it was a helpful video.